All right, uh, let's, <laughs> let's pray and get into the word. Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for your grace to us. Thank you that you are, have called us to uh, be a positive influence on this world and whatever means that is uh, that you call us to. Um, Lord, we've gathered here this morning to worship you, praise you, acknowledge uh, the good that you do in our lives and what you've saved us from and the hope that you give us for the future. And we've also come to hear from you in your word and by your spirit. So we pray that you speak to us and minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you want to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. The title for our study this morning is A Wise Approach. A Wise Approach in Proverbs 19. So my uh, string trimmer, uh, which I call a weed, a weed eater, some people call it a weed whacker, it has the, the line that spins around and you use it to edge and cut weeds and stuff in the yard. So um, uh, my line trimmer has, uh, the carburetor's been a little off for years now. And so like five to 10 years. And so I, uh, I don't have the right tool to adjust it and so what I've been doing for all these years has been just uh, like having to throttle the gas in order to keep it running. If I don't throttle it at the right speed, it'll shut off. So imagine driving your car and having to like pump the gas pedal to keep your car running, right? So like I'm just like pumping the gas and then every once in a while I do it wrong and it shuts off and then I have to like go and restart it again and it's really hard to do and then I got to pump, right? So all this stuff. About a month ago it finally just was like, no, I'm done. I'm done with this uh, thing and it just stopped working. Like it stopped staying on altogether. I could get it going and then it would just shut off because it wasn't adjusted. So uh, it took me about a month of weeds growing in, in the yard and stuff for us to finally buy the right tool. And once we got the right tool off of Amazon, it took me less than five minutes to adjust the carburetor. And now it's running great. Less than five minutes. All these years, I've been pumping the gas on this thing to keep it alive. And it just you know, adjusted the little knobs and it was, it, it was good to go. Easy peasy. Should have done it years ago. <laughs> Sometimes we know what to do, uh, but we just don't do it. And uh, sometimes we let that go on for far too long in our lives. Something that we know we should be doing and we just not doing it. I think a lot of what our chapter this morning gives us are, are things that we know that God says are wise. We've heard the Lord say, this is a wise way to live before, but we've just, from time to time, we just decide not to do it. We decide that it's not the best option for our lives for whatever the reason is. So our chapter gives us a gentle, a really gentle reminder of what the wise approach to these different situations are so that our lives don't crash like my weed whacker. <laughs> so we can start today in, in verses one through nine, which is focused on how we give to others. Verse one, better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge when he sins, uh, who ha hastens with his feet. The foolishness of a man twists his way, and his heart frets against the Lord. Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his friend. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. Many entreat the favor of the nobility, and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. All the brothers of the poor hate him, how much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. 
He who keeps understanding will find good. The false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies shall perish. So we all understand that a life of poverty is less desirable than a life of provision being provided for. But those who are wise actually value integrity even more than provision, even more than getting what they need. So when the opportunity to get ahead at someone else's expense comes along, the wise don't take that opportunity. The wise are willing to sacrifice getting ahead or sacrifice what's best for them uh, in order to do what's right for someone else. A fool who lies and cheats and steals and does perverse things, perverse things being anything that's against the direction of the Lord, a fool who does those things might sometimes appear to succeed because of it. Because they lied, they got ahead. Because they stole, they got ahead. Because they cheated or they did perverse things, they got ahead. But it's always worse for the fool in the end because a lack of integrity brings consequences. Sometimes those are legal consequences. Sometimes those are ruined relationships. Sometimes they get themselves into situations where other people scam them. But there's always consequences associated with a lack of integrity. The wise are willing to sacrifice what they want or even what they need in order to do what's right. So the core value here is humility and sacrificial love. It's putting other people first, not thinking that you deserve or you need to be first or taken care of first, but it's putting other people first. It's actually a burden to our souls to ignore God's wisdom and follow our own desires first instead of putting other people's desires first. We, we react quickly for what we want, and sometimes it gets in the way of the blessing that God is calling us to. And, and when we react quickly to go toward our desires instead of what God's called us to, and then things don't turn out well, we turn right around and we blame God. Like, it's his fault. Why didn't you take care of me when, when we were the ones to walk away from his direction to us? On the other hand, those who receive and follow God's wisdom have peace as a result of that. Even when things in life don't work out exactly the way that we would want them to, when we're following God's wisdom, we come out with peace in any situation, in the blessings that we get and in the situations that aren't, aren't as enjoyable. We're often surprised, in fact, by the blessings that God brings as a result of us following him. We might feel like putting ourselves first will get us ahead, and we begrudgingly say, fine, I'll, I'll do what the Lord says and put somebody else first, and we think that's going to hurt us. We think that we're going to be worse off because of that, and then we're surprised with how God provides for us and how God blesses us because we chose to follow his path and as a result of, ch of following his path. Remember, we've talked about in, in Proverbs, it identifies that God supernaturally blesses people who follow his way, who are wise, who follow the wise way. But also God created the world and the universe to function in a certain way. So when we follow his wisdom, we're, functionally, we're functioning in line with how God created everything. So even just naturally, even without God supernaturally blessing us, which he does, even without that, uh, just naturally when we follow his wisdom, things work out better for us. Like I said, the core of all of this is our humility and our unselfishness. Take the example from the passage of friendships. Everyone wants to be friends with someone who's wealthy. Why? Because we're looking for what we can get out of a friendship. When you're friends with someone who's wealthy, they take you on yacht trips and private plane flights and stuff. If anybody wants to take me on any of those, feel free. I won't hold you back. Uh, people avoid the poor because that friendship is all about what we give others instead of what we get from others. Remember how this passage started, proclaiming that integrity is worth more than wealth. So it's actually better to live following the Lord's wisdom of putting someone else first. It's actually better for us 
meaning that we should seek friends based on what we can do for them, not seek friends based on what they can do for us. So a wise approach to our interactions with other with others is relational integrity. Relational integrity, which is looking for what we can give to others, looking how we can benefit and bless them. For the last uh, like year or two, I've been on the phone with commercial real estate lenders and brokers and stuff to uh, get a handle on you know what our options are as a church for purchasing buildings and, and things like that. And most of the people I talk to are just extremely unhelpful. Um, I can tell in two seconds that all they want out of that conversation is is to make money off of us and and to like uh, make a sale or, or whatever, you know, uh, get get money in their pocket. And I try to get out of those conversations as quickly as possible because it's like I, this is just not helpful. You're not providing me with anything. You're not answering my questions. You're just trying to like get me to do something. But every once in a while, I'll have a conversation like I had just this week with someone who got on the phone with me and like heard out our situation. I just explained some basics and, and he just honestly was like, you know, I'm not a good fit for you right now. Maybe, maybe in the future down the line, but I'm not a good fit and here's why. But I want to help you, give you some advice and some counsel and, and, and show you some of how things work and some different options that you might have and here's the right avenue to go down. So we talked for like 30 minutes past him knowing he wasn't going to get a dime out of, out of us, out of that conversation. We talked for like 30 more minutes of him giving advice on different options and things to go. Just a completely different scenario than all the, like the majority of the people I talk to, which is just like whatever they can say to, to get money out of me. Now, there's a big difference between someone who wants something from you and someone who wants to help you any way they can. There's a giant difference. So we don't want to think about other people by what they can give us. You know, whether that's just good company, like they're just fun to be around, or, or that's helpful advice they can give us, or they can give us money, or they can give us connections, they can give us a fun time, they can give us assistance with something, whatever it is. We don't want to think about what they can give to us. Instead, we want to think about what we can give to other people. What strengths and what resources do I have and, and who around me can benefit from those things that I have, that I can provide to others? We can choose to interact with others based on what, what value we can add to their life. And we do this for nothing in return. Our motivation isn't to get something back, but our motivation is to truly bless people with what God has provided us, what talents and abilities and skills and resources God has provided us. How do we bless the people around us and the needs that they have? Um, but even though we're doing it for nothing in return, we often find that we receive back far more than what we gave, either from that person or for some, from someone else who blesses us or from the Lord directly blessing us. So, um, how we give to others, we approach giving to others by looking for you know, what we can do for them, not looking for what they can do for us. Brings us to verse 10 through 14, how we are patient with others. Verse 10, luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a servant to rule over princes. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Now, in the same way that it is rare for a servant to become a ruler, or in, in our context for like, you know, a, a low-level employee at a company to eventually become CEO at the company. That's a rare thing to happen. It's in the same way, it's rare for a fool to gain an abundance of success and wealth. Now, in both cases, it does sometimes happen. Sometimes the low-level employee works his way up and becomes CEO. Sometimes fools get lucky 
and get successful and, and riches, but it's rare. Most of the time that doesn't happen. One reason for that is that the wise are slow to anger and the wise are patient. The wise desire to forgive, desire to restore other people. This doesn't mean that the wise avoid problems, but the wise seek reconciliation instead of retribution. We've talked about that before. The wise are seeking to reconcile problems with other people instead of making people pay. The wise know it's better to respect and give grace to their leadership, whoever's leaders, political leaders or bosses or whatever else. Uh, it's, it's better to give respect and grace to them rather than challenging them in a way that just hurts their performance, the leader's performance. And on the other hand, wise leaders know to avoid wrath when possible, seeking to help people that they lead instead of um, punishing the people that they lead whenever they can. Now, foolishness has a terrible effect on those around us. Foolish children bring stress and trouble and burden to their parents. I'm sure some parents in here might feel that. Um, it can get as bad for children bringing that kind of stress on their parents. I've, I've seen it ruin parents' lives, complete lives, by how dysfunctional their children have become. Foolish husbands and wives slowly drain the life out of the spouse. Uh, the, the picture here is like a dripping water in the passage. Whereas in, in contrast to that, wise parents and wise children and wise spouses are a gift from God to cherish. But whether or not we have wise children and wise parents and wise spouses or foolish ones, we want to reflect wisdom back to them. So a wise approach to dealing with frustrating people, dealing with frustrating situations, is to deal with it with patience and forgiveness. A wise approach to frustrating situations and people is patience and forgiveness. We were catching up with one of our uh, one of the people in our neighborhood recently, and the conversation moved to some marriage problems that he's having. His his marriage is on the rocks, and of course, there's many reasons for that, and there's two sides to every story. I only got one side in this scenario, but um, one of the main things that he mentioned was that he would go to his to work, from long, long shifts at work, and his wife would stay home throughout the day, and he'd leave the house when the house is clean, and throughout the day, just from being around the house, she would, you know, create a mess, dishes and laundry and, and stuff everywhere, and he'd come home, and the house is just a mess, and, and then he has to go from this long shift at work, he has to come home, and he has to clean the dishes, and he has to do laundry, and he has to clean up the house, and then he leaves the next day, and his wife's at home, and then he comes back, and the house is a mess again, over and over and over again for years and years and years with tons of different, you know, solutions that they tried and stuff without, without success. Now, you can, like, see, I can, like, I could, I could picture this. I haven't experienced this because my wife is amazing, but I could picture, like, that would be extremely frustrating, like, insanely frustrating. And if you don't have the wisdom of the Lord, that's kind of the end of the road. Like you've tried a bunch of things already and there's no other options here. And so, you know, you either are just have to live with that or, you know, you got to end it. You know, that's kind of the end of the relationship. But with the wisdom of the Lord, we lead into those situations with patience and forgiveness. The type of patience and forgiveness that it doesn't matter how many times we come home to that mess. I will bear with my wife. I will forgive her for it, work with her on it, and try to work through it, no matter how many times it comes. That's a type of patience and forgiveness that I don't see outside of the Lord. Only with the Lord. I mean, talk about wisdom that we... Uh, no, we should follow, but don't want to follow, right? It's textbook. But there are very few conflicts in this life that have been solved by acting out of frustration and acting out of anger. Ironically, acting out of frustration and anger typically makes the situation much, much worse. 
escalates the situation and makes the problem even continue even worse. Unfortunately, there's no self-help or easy trick to fix our anger and our frustration. We have to take it to the Lord. We have to tell him our problems. We have to let him give us peace. Let him direct our steps. And only after the Holy Spirit fills us with patience and forgiveness can we adequately address a frustrating situation like that. Now, it's easy for me to say that, but it's more difficult for us to live that and experience that. So we might wonder, Lord, I know you called me to patience and you called me to forgiveness, but how in the world am I supposed to actually do that in these super frustrating situations that just feel like they're going to be ongoing and ongoing? Well, when the disciples asked Jesus a similar question to that in Matthew chapter 17 and in Mark 9, they're asking him, why couldn't we cast out this demon? This demon, you called us to cast out demons, Lord. Why couldn't we cast out this one? Jesus said that even with a tiny amount of faith, they could move mountains. And that the way to get there the way to get to the amount of faith that you could move mountains, to the amount of faith that you can cast out demons, to the amount of faith that you can deal with a frustrating situation is to seek God more and more and more through prayer and fasting. Two things that are central to the Christian life that we might not do enough of. We seek the Lord more and more through prayer and fasting. Now, that advice that Jesus gave his disciples is the same advice to us today. There's not a quick trick to fix our frustration and our anger. The only thing is taking it back to the Lord, back to the Lord, back to the Lord with prayer and fasting until he becomes victorious over that in our lives. And we can have true peace, true forgiveness, patience with those that are extremely frustrating and aggravating in our lives or situations that are frustrating and aggravating. So that's how we're patient with others. Verses 15 through 24, it's how we act on direction. Let's read verse 15. Laziness casts one into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul but he who is careless of his ways will die. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. A man of great wrath will suffer punishment, for if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. Listen to counsel and receive instruction, that you may be wise in your latter days. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. What is desired in a man is kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. A lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Just get the picture of like someone on the couch putting his hand in a like a Doritos bowl and like too lazy to (laughs) pull it back to his mouth. So first of all, we need to listen to the Lord. Having the fear of the Lord that drives us to obey his word, that brings us life. The fear of the Lord driving us to obey his word brings us life. Now, of course, it brings us eternal life as we trust him for our salvation, but it also brings us satisfaction in our lives on this earth, here today. The fear of the Lord driving us to follow him brings us the satisfaction in our lives. Now, evil comes upon those who are careless about the, about the Lord. I think that the word careless, I think, sums it up really well. I just don't care about God. So people that are careless about the Lord Obviously, that can bring eternal death if they don't trust the Lord for salvation. But even with Christians who are careless about the Lord, 
who don't want to hear the Lord's voice in their life. That invites evil attack on us. We're not following the Lord's wisdom. When we don't care, we're inviting evil to attack us. So we first need to listen to the Lord. We then must act on what we heard from the Lord. Those who are lazy or those who don't take initiative to act cause themselves to suffer consequences from that that cause themselves to lack, that they don't have what they need because they failed to act on what the Lord spoke to them. We sometimes find ourselves acting out against others because what we failed to do. You know, we, we blame others or we, or we say that others should be helping us because we failed to act on what we're responsible for and what the Lord called us to do. And even after we get help from people, we then put ourselves right back in the same situation by failing to act again after that and failing to learn from that situation. So not only do we need to listen to the Lord, but then we need to act on what the Lord is calling us to do. And as a result, we end up providing for other people who have less than us. The Lord's plan is to provide for people who lack. Provide for people who lack financially, who lack relationally, don't have good friendships and good relationships. People who lack emotionally, who are in turmoil inside, who lack physically, who are just restricted in what they physically can do. So we partner with the Lord when we serve and give to those who have less than us. This type of kindness and honest care is something that other people will value in us as well. And we trust that God will provide for us just as God is using us to provide for other people. So we're not worried about wasting our resources on helping other people because God will provide for us in the same way that he's using us to help provide for someone else. Finally, we teach others and learn ourselves. We're responsible to teach and discipline our children while they're still in our household And likewise, we're responsible to disciple and encourage other Christians that the Lord puts on our life. In the same way, God provides us with counsel and instruction to follow as well ourselves. Those who are wise follow this biblical direction from parents and from mentors and from the Lord himself. So a wise approach to the word of God is to obey him by taking initiative to act on what he calls us to. That includes providing for others who are in need. It includes encouraging other Christians through helping direct them. And it includes continuing to learn from the Lord ourselves. I know an older person who recently needed some physical work done at their house that they couldn't do themselves. And they reached out to people in their church and like asked people in the church, do you know someone I could hire? Do you know someone who can come help me? Asked a bunch of people. Nobody gave them anything to work with, any help or any contacts or anything like that. It took until another church caught wind of that situation, heard about that situation for the other church to take initiative to come and help this person and and just take care of the problem, like go and, and serve at the house and take care of the problem that needed to be done. Now, in an ideal scenario, situations like that shouldn't happen because the people of the church should be hunting. We should be hunting for ways that we can help each other, looking for every single way that we can assist one another and be there for each other. So I encourage all of us today to ask people after church what needs they have and what we are capable of providing for them you know, and out of our own skill sets and our own resources, what we can provide for them. Even better would be just under, like hearing about someone's life after church today and understanding where they're at and understand what struggles they have and stuff. And then identifying something on your own that you're good at or a skill set that you have or whatever that you can specifically offer that specific thing to someone else. Now this is, this, our church is a very easy and safe environment to practice this skill because we love each other and we're close to one another and, and uh, we give each other grace. And so this is a really easy environment to practice doing that. Um, but ideally, this would extend to all aspects of our life, not just the church. That when we're interacting with our neighbors, we're doing the same thing, hunting for ways we can help them, 
when we're interacting with people at work, hunting for ways to, to help them. And when we're interacting with, you know, whoever, wherever, family members and people at the store, whatever, we're looking for ways that we can provide something of, of value to them to, to help them out and bring them assistance. We can help people with finances by giving finances or by giving financial advice if we're good at that. We can help people with friendships, providing them a friend of ourselves, but also helping them get part of bigger friend groups. We can help people with their emotional struggles, listen to them talk about what they're going through. We can help people with physical tasks. If we're capable, go and actually take care of something for someone. We can help someone by mentorship, by providing some guidance to their life. We can help give relationship advice. And the list goes on and on. It's whatever you're gifted at, whatever you're good at, whatever resources you have, those are the things that you look for to be able to provide for someone else. So this is how we act on the Lord's direction to our life. And in verses 25 through 29, this is how we receive correction. Verse 25, strike a scoffer and the simple will become weary. Rebuke one who has understanding and he will discern knowledge. He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. A disreputable witness scorns justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Judgments are prepared for scoffers and beatings for the backs of fools. This passage is really simple and really clear. That when we receive correction, it's foolish to feel discouraged because of that correction. Oh man, like this sucks. Like someone corrected me. Or it's it's foolish to ignore it. Just be like, I don't want to hear that correction at all. It's foolish to get angry at it. How dare you say that to me? Do you know who I am? It's foolish. Those of you who are asleep, I had to wake you up. It's like a child who fights against their parent and then ends up getting hurt because they're fighting against their parent. That's us fighting against correction. Now it's wise to hear correction and then to learn from it. Either hearing the wise correction from the Lord directly and taking that and, and, and directly following that direction or hearing direction from other people, correction from other people, where it could be wise or it could be unwise. It could be just false direction or correction, I mean. But we can still learn from it. We can still understand how they're perceiving things and learn how to grow from that as well. In the end, those who fight against what is right feel the consequences of judgment and failure. Feel the consequences of, of the things that they do. They also feel the consequences of failing just like a kid fighting against their parents, try something, falls straight on their face. You know, you, you, feel, you fight against correction, you feel the consequences of that. So a wise approach to receiving correction is to value that correction, to appreciate that correction, and to learn from that correction. Yesterday I was walking around our uh, outreach at the Delta Market a little bit, and I was looking for a booth of a different religion who was there a month, a couple months ago, and one of the outreaches who I got to talk to for an amount of time, and I, I, I didn't get to talk to them this time. I didn't see their booth there, but a few months ago when I was talking with them, um, we we got into a really friendly conversation, but a, a conversation about uh, discussing which holy book was more historically accurate than than the other, and we you know we went back and forth for a good amount of time, and I don't. I didn't. I can't perceive that I helped them see anything. Uh, it, you, you know, in conversations like that, the Holy Spirit's always working. So there's always ground that the Lord makes um, without you knowing. Um, so that probably happened. But I didn't see. I didn't see that I won them over in in any amount. Um, and so it would be easy for me to walk away from that conversation feeling discouraged. Like I, like I didn't do a good enough job supporting the Bible, or I didn't answer their questions well enough, or like, I wish I would have said this or that. Um, but I didn't. I walked away from that conversation excited. 
because I walked away learning a ton, learning about how they think, learning what their like top arguments were, learning about what they heard about the Bible that's false, what they know about the Bible that's true, learning what I said that landed better with them, like they heard that and they didn't have an answer for it and that was kind of persuasive to them, and learning from what I said that didn't hit them at all. Like I thought it was a, a good thing to say, but they like were like, that's stupid, you know? And so I got to learn from all of those different things. So not only on its own, any conversation about the Lord is meaningful. So on its own, that's just a win that we got to talk about the Lord and about the Bible. But even more so, I got to learn a ton. And so now I can go back to the outreach whenever we do it. And I can go looking for their booth because I want to try out some of the stuff that I thought about and adjust, you know, my communication to see what would land more and learn even more about from my failure as I talk to them and they, uh, they laugh at me or whatever. You know, I, I want to learn from that experience. So if we're receiving correction directly from God via the Bible or via the Holy Spirit, we should, that, that correction should actually be refreshing to us like refreshing. God gives us restorative correction, meaning that when he corrects us, it makes our lives better. God's correction makes our lives better, not harder. And so it should be refreshing to us to receive the Lord's correction. And even if we're being corrected by others or being corrected by a situation where it didn't go, like we didn't we didn't handle that situation perfect, even if we're being corrected by that. We can still be excited about what we can learn from that situation. We can be excited about how we can grow from that situation. So correction is something that we can truly appreciate and be excited about receiving. So we know the Lord calls us to approach these situations like this. We know the Lord calls us to give to others and to be patient and forgiving with others and to act on his direction when he directs us for us to take the initiative ourselves to act quickly on what he calls us to we know that the lord calls us to receive correction from him and and learn from situations and other people who try to correct us we know that all of these things are wise things for our lives Sometimes we get stuck feeling like uh, we don't want to do them or we want to ignore them or they're too hard or we don't really believe that following this wisdom will actually help our lives. We think maybe we think intellectually like, yeah, probably following the Bible is best. But when we get down to it, when we're staring at being patient with a frustrating person in the face, when we're staring at that situation, we think, you know, it's better that I let them know how angry I am right now. We, we think, uh, I don't really want to follow the Lord's wisdom in this scenario. But hopefully this chapter gives us a gentle encouragement to follow the Lord's wisdom in how we approach these different situations. Just a gentle reminder of, hey, no, the Lord's way is really the wisest way here. It's really the way that turns out best. For, for us, is that if we choose his wisdom over whatever other path that we would take on our own. And hopefully we receive this gentle encouragement from the Lord before our lives fall apart like my weed whacker, <laughs> right? And on that note, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for, for this encouragement and the gentleness that you bring this encouragement to us. That you've shown us wise ways we can handle these different situations. But we don't always follow those wise ways. So we appreciate the reminder. We appreciate you showing us how this can apply to some of the areas in our lives. And we pray that you uh, move us powerfully by your spirit to follow you in these wise ways and see the benefits of that. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second, if you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never believed that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, and you've given your life to him so that he can forgive you of anything you've ever done wrong, and he can give you eternal life. 
could transform your life today. If you've never trusted him with that, and you'd like to give your life to Jesus today, if you want to raise your hand, I'd love to pray for you. Does anybody want to trust in Jesus for the first time today? Those of you raising your hands online, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these who are choosing to believe in you. I pray that they believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. They believe that by trusting in Jesus, they will receive everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. And we pray that you grant that to them today. We'll keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second longer. If the Lord has given you a gentle reminder about the wise approach that he's calling you to in a situation in your life. If you'd like to raise your hand, I'd love to pray for you and pray for that situation. Amen, 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 amen. Anyone else want to be included in this prayer? Amen. Father, I thank you for these who you have revealed a gentle reminder, a gentle encouragement about a situation in their life where there's a wise approach. They know that you're calling them to that approach. They know your wisdom of how to approach it, uh, but uh, they just needed the gentle push today. So we pray that you uh, grant them the patience and the forgiveness that are necessary to approach that situation. Um, we pray that you give them the wisdom to navigate through the specifics. It's easy to talk general like this, but Lord, we need your wisdom in the specifics of these situations. And we pray for the situations themselves, Lord. We pray that you help alleviate conflict and, and resolve the, the, the challenge of these situations. Be with them as they're dealing with these things. And we pray for grace for them, grace for the other people involved. Pray for the situation to be resolved and healed and alleviated. For all of us, Lord, we thank you for your counsel to us this morning. We thank you for how we speak, how you speak to us. We thank you for being here with us. In Jesus' name we pray and we praise you. Amen.